Today is Tuesday, July 8, 2014. It's the 189th day of the year. There are 176 days remaining until the end of 2014. Sunrise today is at 5.14 a.m. The sun sets at 8.36 p.m. Length of daylight hours today is 15 hours, 21 minutes, 59 seconds. One minute, five seconds shorter than yesterday. Tomorrow will be one minute, nine seconds shorter than today. The waxing gibbous moon rises today with 84.3% illumination at 4.35 p.m. and sets at 2.35 a.m. Wednesday. The moon passes today above downtown Rutland City at 231,976 miles distant from the center of planet Earth within the eighth zodiacal designation Scorpio, the Scorpion. On this day in 1947, reports are published throughout the country that a flying disc crash-landed near Roswell, New Mexico. Roswell Army Airfield Public Information Office sends a news release July 7, 1947 to local and regional news media with a story that personnel from the 509th Operational Group has recovered a flying disc which has crashed on the ranch owned by J.B. Foster between Roswell and Corona, New Mexico. This is the first misdirection. The Army would rather the public believe a flying saucer from outer space has crashed in the desert than draw any closer attention to what is really going on at the base. Project Mogul, sometimes referred to as Operation Mogul, is a top secret project by the U.S. Army Air Forces involving microphones flown on high altitude balloons whose primary purpose is the long distance detection of sound waves generated by Soviet atomic bomb tests. The project was carried out from 1947 until early 1949. I know, big deal, right? That local paper, the Roswell Daily Record, doesn't have a clue because top secret, but thinking it has a terrific story does some snooping around, just only not in the right that is the most obvious place. They find publicity shy Foster Ranch foreman W.W. Bill Brazell, 48 years old, who tells the paper on June 14 that he and his eight-year-old son, Vernon, are about seven or eight miles from the ranch house when they come upon a large area, a field of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tinfoil, a rather tough paper, and sticks. The record reports in its July 8 edition, Brazell, his son, along with Brazell's wife and 14-year-old daughter, Betty, return to the crash site on July 4, 1947 and gather up quite a lot of the debris. Later in the day, July 8, 1947, the record reports commanding General of the 8th Air Force, Roger Ramey, tells a hastily assembled press conference featuring debris, foil, rubber, wood, said to be from the crashed object, that a weather balloon is what is really recovered from the RAAF personnel. This is the second misdirection in a single day, certainly the more credible. Ranch foreman Brazell says he previously found two weather observation balloons on the ranch, but what he found this time did not in any way resemble either of these. I'm sure, Brazell says, that what I found was not any weather observation balloon, he says. But if I find anything else besides a bomb, they're going to have a hard time getting me to say anything about it. On this day in 1960, Francis Gary Powers is charged with espionage resulting from his flight over the Soviet Union. In 1957, during the administration of President Dwight Eisenhower, the U.S. requests and receives permission to build an air base in Pakistan from which to launch airborne surveillance of Soviet military installations. The facility, established 10 miles from Peshawar, is a cover for a major communications intercept operation run by the American National Security Agency. The surveillance aircraft of choice is the U-2, built by Lockheed Martin, chosen because it can fly at altitudes up to 70,000 feet far higher than any Soviet aircraft can attain, and is thought to be out of range of existing Soviet guided missiles. On May 1, 1960, Captain Francis Gary Powers departs from the Peshawar Air Base for a mission code named Operation Grand Slam. He is to overfly the Soviet Union south to north, photograph targets including Soviet ICBM sites, then land in Norway. The Soviets, no slouches in the intelligence gathering department themselves, expect the U-2 overflight and are on red alert with orders to bring Powers down dead or alive. The U-2, piloted by Powers, is on track to depart Soviet airspace when it's hit by the first of a three-stage battery of surface-to-air missiles near Kusalino in the Ural Mountains. Powers bails out. He carries with him a silver dollar containing a poison needle with orders to use the thing rather than be taken alive. Powers takes his chances, is captured, tried, and sentenced to three years in prison and seven years of hard labor. Of that sentence, Powers serves one year, nine months before being freed in a prisoner exchange. Not only a great embarrassment to Eisenhower, who has been doing so well avoiding direct blame for any of the follies inflicted by his administration upon an otherwise hapless post-war world, the U-2 incident leads not only to the kibosh of the impending four-power summit meeting in Paris, only days away, but a deepening of the Cold War. Born this day in 1926, 
Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Swiss-American psychiatrist and author of the groundbreaking On Death and Dying, in which she theorizes about the five stages of grief, also known as the Kubler-Ross model. The stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Originally, Kubler-Ross develops that theory as related to the terminally ill. Later, she expands the model to apply to anyone who experiences catastrophic loss. That's anyone. Kubler-Ross works with thousands of terminally ill patients and comes to the conclusion that the majority of human beings given the choice, which, of course, who is, but what if, would prefer life, and perhaps a little dessert. The Mahatma Gandhi writes, I object to violence because when it appears to do good, the good is only temporary. The evil it does is permanent. From Rutland, Vermont, this is Richard Alcott speaking.